We have a, this is actually a great pleasure of mine to put on a panel for the War and Peace program at Dartmouth College on military service and what it means to those of us that have served. Before we begin on the panel though, I'd like to uh, thank the folks that have made this possible. Um, with this program and a couple of other events in the next few weeks, I'm reaching the end of my term as coordinator of War and Peace Studies at Dartmouth. I'd very much like to thank Mike Mastanduna, who I am certain is not here. Um, he was the person that appointed me in the first place four years ago to coordinate this program. I'd very much like to thank Ken Yalowitz in the Dickey Center. Um, Ken has been an extraordinary supporter of our program. Uh, he has provided financial and moral support for every single program I have suggested. Some of them have been extraordinarily controversial. Ken has received more than his share of hate mail as a result of some of the people I've brought to campus. He has allowed us to do programs like this that I don't, to the best of my knowledge, this is not the sort of thing that we see repeated frequently on college campuses. I'd also like to thank Chris Wolforth and Diane Casey for providing the administrative support for someone like me who is a total administrative rube. If it was not for people like uh, Chris and Diane, none of these things would ever occur. I'd also like to thank all of you, the students, faculty, alumni and community members that have attended these events that we've put on for the last four years. Without you, without having someone to speak to, uh, it'd be sort of like the proverbial tree falling in the woods. More importantly, I think the thing that I valued most about these settings is that the audiences have never failed to ask the hard and uncomfortable questions that many of us, or certainly many of the people that I've invited to speak, wanted to answer. <clears throat> what I'd like to do before I introduce the people is to provide a couple of thoughts about our panel's genesis. For the past four years, as the coordinator of the War and Peace program, I've put together events and panels basically by and for activists, policymakers, academics, filmmakers, the occasional war criminal, advocates for oppressed peoples, policies and places, historians, and bureaucrats. We have had authors trying to plug their latest best efforts. The unifying themes have always been driven by our program's title, War and Peace Studies, with a heavy, heavy-handed emphasis on peace, bringing to campus the folks that work hard to try and prevent war, the people that think very hard about the brutishness of war, the people that think about trying to figure out ways to make war as an institution come to the end. As I thought about the themes for the final panel that I would organize and host, I realized that we have in large part ignored the people who are actually involved in the training for and prosecution of wars themselves. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the nature of military service and what it has meant to each of us. There is no high level academic theme here. We have no institutional agenda here. I know with certainty that the panel does not have consensus on any of the issues we're going to talk about. Recently, I was on a panel where the central puzzle was, how do you support the soldier if you do not support the mission? I thought a lot about that as I was preparing my remarks for that. And in the end, it seemed to me the interesting thing there was that we as non-soldiers today should never judge the motives of those that choose or were drafted into service. But in fact, we should simply judge them for the fact that they served. While I was sitting on that panel in White River Junction a couple of weeks ago, it occurred to me, though, that many of the people at Dartmouth might not really understand who the people that actually serve their country in the military service are and how they may have come to serve. This afternoon, we have a panel of military and combat veterans all of whom who have some connection to Dartmouth. Now, as a social scientist, I have to certainly disclose here that this panel of extraordinarily distinguished people, myself not included, is not representative. It's not a representative sample of today's military. It's not a random draw. That said, this is not a huge anomaly either. An event like this, <clears throat> excuse me, could be put together at any university in America today. We don't see them very often, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't exist. Before I share my own thoughts on military service, though, what I'd like to do is introduce our panelists in alphabetical order, and then what we're going to do is speak to you 
in sort of reverse chronological order. We'll start with the person that has the longest ago service experience to the, to the United States, and we'll conclude with the person that has the most recent and current service. Our panelists in alphabetical order are Pete Blyler, Dartmouth class of 61. He's now a retired consultant. He served as a weapons officer in, Navy submarine, in the Navy submarine service in the Pacific and the Atlantic. Our second panelist, who unfortunately is not here due to a severe illness who he contracted in the last day, George Demko, he provided me with remarks that I'll actually read to you. He is a professor of geography, emeritus. He was a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps in Korea. The third panelist is Wesley Lippman, Dartmouth class of 03. He's a first lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps, having served in Iraq. Our fourth panelist is Eugene Lyons. He's the Orville Dreyfus Professor of Public Affairs and Professor of Government Emeritus. He was an infantry sergeant in the European Theater of Operations in World War II. Our next panelist is Rich Morales. Rich has the distinction of being the only person here who has no direct contact or connection with Dartmouth. I invited Rich. Rich served with me as a teaching assistant when I was a professor at Yale University. Rich was on leave from the military going to business school, and he decided the business school at Yale wasn't busy enough, and so he volunteered to work as a teaching assistant in addition to his duties and assignments as a business school student. He is today a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army, in, stationed in Germany, soon again in Iraq. He is also amongst us the only professional soldier. Uh, Rich is a graduate of the United States Military Academy. And I'm your moderator, Alan Stamm. I'm the Daniel Webster Professor of Government and War and Peace Studies Coordinator. I served as a communication specialist in the United States Army Special Forces. So right now I'd like to turn it over to Gene. Thank you very much. He turns it over to me because I'm the oldest living member of this panel. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I, I would, would this, uh, Alan asked me to, I must say, he didn't ask me to serve in the panel. I came back for vacation and found that I was on the panel. <laughs> uh, but when I, he asked me to do it, I began to think back because I, uh, I don't remember specifics. I only have kind of impressions. And interestingly enough, you know, one thinks about being in the military uh, and being in a unit, one thinks of the comradeship, and certainly there was a lot of that. But one of the impressions that I left with, and one of the visions, one of the uh, pictures in the mind um, that I have of myself during the war is sitting alone and being very lonely, sitting alone in a, in a foxhole on the edge of a forest and under a relentless artillery barrage. That's the one remembrance that I have, of being lonely and sitting under a barrage all by myself. I knew that there were others, members of my squad close by, and I could get to them as we were positioned so that we could get to each other, but it's loneliness that I remember, and I, I wonder if that hits a bell with any of the others. Uh, but this, that was a long time ago, and. Um, this quality of loneliness is, uh, as I say, is what the first thing I thought about. But I've also, there's another thought I've often had, and that is that in the Second World War, as I think, who was it who said it was the good war, you remember, in the light of what we've been through since then, it was the good war. And if I had to be in the good war, I was fighting where I wanted to be. I was with the infantry, um, right down, you know, down where the, the grunt guys are, and we were right hand in hand um, uh, uh, with uh, the opponent and with your friends and your comrades. And yet at the same time, it is such a different kind of war. It was that when I see the visions of what's happening, for example, in Iraq where Wes was, uh, it's door to door, hand to hand. We were out there with great armies that were one, again, we were no longer like uh, as they were in the First World War in trench warfare, one against the other, but we were in large groups and spread over, over a long, uh, heavy space. And, very, and, and the war was at a distance. There was a lot of strategic bombing, a lot of artillery shells, and we did come in contact. But it seems to me that in Iraq, at least I'd like to hear from Wes about that, it seems to me you're in contact with the enemy day after day 
You know, it's a quite a different kind of background. And what's one of the things that it might be interesting to speculate on, that when you think about war, there's certain different levels. One is the political objective that I think Alan was uh, alluding to. Uh, I say the Second World War was a good war because there was a consensus uh, on the political objectives. There's no question about that. Uh, other wars that we've been in, there have been varying degrees of political agreement. And the one we're in now is the, the most divisive war in many respects that we've been in on. But anyway, let me go back, though, and say that uh, you know, it wasn't a, um, uh, a direct uh, line between the time I was in college, because I was in college when the war started, um, until I arrived at the Battle of the Bulge in December of 1944, which was the largest engagement that I was in, involved in. And how did I get you know, from being a college student Wearing, uh, we used to wear beanie caps, freshman caps at that time. We don't no, no longer do that. We've been, we've been liberated. You've been liberated from that. But how did I go from there to uh, being a member of a mortar squad in Company E of the 364th uh, Infantry Regiment? Well, it was not a direct route, not at all. I spent two years uh, at college before the war, and then in the spring of 1943, uh, entered into military service and went to basic training for, I guess, 10 weeks or so. Um, at the end of that 10 weeks, I was chosen to be in a program that was called the ASTP, the Army Specialized Training Program. Um, this was a program that was inaugurated um, in, uh, for several reasons. And I think there was the political reasons. That was to use the uh, universities and colleges that were being, the, uh, 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 being emptied out uh, of men. Uh, but I was fortunate, the first college I went to was Baylor University in Texas, and it was not denuded of women. The women were all there, the men were no longer there. And while we were in a military situation, it was sort of like being at college. We lived in dormitories, we went to classes, and we uh, uh, ran after the women at night. Uh, except we got admonished by our colonel, that was the only difference. You didn't get admonished by a dean, you got admonished by a colonel who could really do things to you. <laughs> But then I went on to Texas A&M in, in College Station, Texas. Uh, and as I say, that too was uh, much more military because that was a very large ROTC program and that's been a, a kind of a, a base for a lot of military recruitment. But in the spring of 1944, when I was still at uh, Texas A&M, the ASTP was broken up, the, the program was broken. And you know, it was very curious how my life began to interwine over the years. Because in 1958 and 1959, I was doing research on military uh, personnel problems. And I got permission to go into the Army archives, which were, these particular archives were in Alexandria, Virginia. And in this dusty warehouse where all these dusty files were, I suddenly came across files that said ASTP. And I could, out of curiosity, I began to open a file, and I found out what had happened, why we were disbanded in the spring of 1944. Well, the memoranda went back to the late 1943 and early 1944, and what had happened was that the top brass had been appraised of the fact that sooner or later we would be invading the continent, the Normandy, what came to be the Normandy landings in June 6, though they didn't know exactly when that was going to happen. <laughs> But what they had to be sure of, that there were going to be reserve forces ready to move in after the first forces hit the beaches. And they began to look around for available troops. And we were available troops. Um, and so uh, from Texas A&M and College Station, I was transferred to Camp Miles Standish, which was in Cape Cod, not far from where I now, where I now have a vacation home, which is kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then went over. Uh, uh, I remember going, arriving in Glasgow, as a matter of fact, and taking the train down to southern England where we went back into training. And in the meanwhile, of course, June 6th had passed and, and our troops had, had fought their way through and had, had uh, come out on the other side of the, uh, the beaches of Normandy. Uh, and then we went up in uh, the early fall of 1944, first as reserve, and then we went into the front lines in about October or so in 1944, and that's how I got to become a member of a mortar squad. Um, now this has been a group that had been together in the, 
for over a year and a half in the train together, and I was new. And there's something else I was struck by. I began to realize that there were a lot of people in this country I had never knew anything about. I just heard about them. And I began to be contact, in contact with the direct contact. And particularly, I was struck by young men, and they all, we were all young men, um, who had been farmers and been from the South particularly. They had been hunters. They knew what to do with a gun. I didn't. I mean, I was really, I just had to learn what, the, what a gun was and what, how you handle it. But they knew what to do instinctively. They'd been hunting all their lives since they were kids. And the other thing they knew is that when we went out in night patrol, they know just where to walk and how to put your feet down. And, what, and they knew all, everything about the, the night noises. I knew nothing about night noises. You know, there were noises. So for me, they were, I was an urban type. And I heard noises, uh, you know, the uh, fire engines and things like that. But they heard sounds of animals and sounds of birds. And they knew what they were. And they were marvelous. And they taught me. I was humble before them. And they taught me. They were real, the real leaders in, in, during that war. And uh, I also remember that um, by the time we got to England and the invasion had broken down, we were there and we arrived in, in France and moved quickly into Belgium. And that was where, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in early December of 1944, the uh, Germans decided to, on one last attack, uh, one last offensive to try to break through. And there's a lot of controversy, which I've learned since about. Uh, uh, the, the military command was not sure that that was a wise thing to do, but it came from top. It came from the political direction. It came from Adolf Hitler, presumably. And they started that, and that's the, I remember the beginnings of that, because that's when the loneliness figure came into being. Because I remember myself alone in the foxhole with a relentless artillery barrage about 4 o'clock in the morning. I'll never forget it. That I'll never forget as long as I live. But it's, imp it's an impression. I don't remember the specifics. I don't, I don't remember getting up and going out and moving. But we did move. And one of the things that happened, of course, it happened to a lot of people, that we all got lost. I didn't get I got lost. And not we didn't all get lost. Some of them were smarter than I was. But I got lost. <laughs> because the lines began to move. You've read about the um, Battle of the Bulge. The Germans broke through in certain areas, and we broke through in other areas, and we found ourselves behind each other's lines. And I wandered around. Sometimes I was with a couple of Americans who I sort of picked up. And sometimes, curiously enough, we bumped into Germans who were in the same situation. What did we do? Nothing. We did absolutely nothing. And that I remember so vividly. Kind of nodding to the Germans, putting our hands on our side arms, because I had a side arm, uh, but taking our hands right off and going like this. And the, what, there was no sense. We didn't want to take any prisoners. We were lost. We're going to hustle around with a German in our hand. And yet I didn't want to shoot them. Why well, shoot them? Well, you know, I couldn't imagine there was any possible reasons. I was too scared anyway. Um, uh, and so we wandered around until we finally um, uh, found uh, groups of Americans and we could, uh, who could identify where our own units were, and we went back and found our own units, and the comradery uh, came into play. Now, that was fine. The other thing I remember about that whole thing is that about a month later, I was sent to the hospital. I was never, never wounded. I never got a purple heart. Um, but I did get exhausted, and I got pneumonia, and I was sent back to uh, the hospital in the south of Paris, and I've often told my friends this, that the first time I saw Paris, I was in the back of an ambulance. And the Arc de Triomphe was up and down. And the medic there said, well, we're going down to the Champs-Élysées, and it's 6 o'clock in the morning, and it's beautiful. I said, great. Uh, <laughs> but I was sort of out, out like a light. And it was only that when I went back there and when we lived there that I found out that that's, that's where my, the woman I married was born. Uh, and then we went back and we lived there for a couple of years. So I learned about the Champs-Élysées right side up. <laughs> now, I guess it was the time in the hospital, more than anything else, where I decided when I got back, I wouldn't go to law school. That would have been my dream. I was going to go to law school. And I decided I would not go to law school. I'd go back and study international relations, believe it or not. And that's what I did. 
And I went back and I finished up after the war was over. And in 1947, I got my degree in June, my BA in June. And a month later, I was on a ship going back to Europe and going to the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, Switzerland, via Paris, which I had to see on my way to Geneva. And I remember, however, before that, uh, when we went into occupation after the war, when the war was over, which we learned, the war, we learned about the war being over about three days after it officially was over. Uh, the, the word was slow getting, but I was then in, in near Würzburg, Germany, which is, it was a beautiful, it is a beautiful university town which was demolished. It's an interesting story, if I may take another moment, Alan, about Würzburg. Some of you may have been here, uh, I guess about a month or so ago, when uh, Joska Fischer, uh, the former uh, foreign minister of Germany, spoke. He spoke at the Walter Pickard Memorial Lecture, if you may recall. Well, Walter Pickard was, was a member of the Bundestag, one of the, uh, the German parliament, who had arranged for a, a grant of money from the Bundestag to begin what is, is now sort of a, 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 the, uh, the lecture, lecture that we have and the visitor uh, that we usually have from Germany, a scholar or a man of state. Well, Walter was here uh, at Dartmouth uh, at, at a point when we were negotiating this, and he and I were having a drink together. And uh, we sort of, you remember Walter, those of you who may remember, he, he, had, he had only had one arm, one arm he had lost during the war. And I asked him where he'd been. He said, well, he'd been near Würzburg. I said, really? I, that's where, uh, I was near there too. And it turned out we were there about the same time. Um, and he said to me, you know, someday you should come and visit with me, and we should take a trip down together. Because I had been at a little town called Weitschochheim, which was right near Würzburg, uh, which Walter knew very well. And I said, I'd like to see uh, Weitschochheim again. So when I was in Germany, I went to Frankfurt, where Walter lived, and stayed with, stayed with him. And then one day, we got in his car. He said, we're going down to Würzburg. Well, Walter, as I said, he had one arm. And he drove with one arm about 90 miles an hour down the Autobahn. I never thought we'd got there, but we did get there. And we went around, and I remembered everything. We went into Weitschochheim particularly, because I remembered the, the city hall. I had served as a kind of liaison between my commanding officer and the mayor who had been assigned by the counterintelligence to be the mayor. He was a, an old man who had been mayor before the Nazis had take, taken over. And I spoke mongrel German about, but nobody else spoke any German, uh, which makes me think of, you know, the, the Arabic people uh, one needs now in Iraq and the, pro and the importance of language. Um, and I went back and there was a, had been a labyrinth before in front of the city hall. And there it was cropped now because it was, when I was there it was overgrown. But it was, oh, it was just beautifully done. Just only the Germans could, could do it as beautifully as they did that. And uh, with Walter, I went back there uh, and had that, that kind of memory too. So there have been a lot of interlocking things, things that have happened since that have brought me back to that experience so over 60 years ago. Uh, but it was an experience, I've had a mixed experience. And I think of it now because uh, I also became engaged in international relations. I taught here for a number of years and did work on a lot of military issues. And as I say, I was, when I was doing research on some <coughs> military issues, it's when I came across the file of what happened to my unit. But I'll stop there. You don't get to go next. No. No, George Demko does. Um, I have a letter from George Demko that he asked me to read. Dear Al, I have just returned from Europe, a day late and very ill. I have a lung infection, thus I must beg off from tonight's panel despite wanting to be part of it. If you want to provide my opinions, and I wish you would, here they are. I firmly believe that we should have obligatory military service for all men and all women, two-year period. There should be an alternative service proposition for conscientious objectors and similar type individuals. Given the world's geopolitical situation in the future, the US will need a larger army of prepared people. Even given the elimination of stupid, unprovoked wars like Iraq, the US military will face terrorism, probably more Darfurs and other humanitarian efforts. The military must change its training to prepare for humanitarian efforts. These include changes of language and changes in our military culture. We need to stop trying to be so macho with arrogant attack titles like 
tip of the spear, and other warlike names. The military must become more intelligent and less macho. Universal service will provide the nation's youth with discipline, maturity, and increased out experiences in diversity. <clears throat> there should be equity, no exemptions for rich or privileged kids, a lesson need for poorly educated kids and poor kids who have no other options. The military will be seated with normal and bright and educated young people. In my own case, I was a poor and uneducated kid who joined the Marine Corps because I had few reasonable options. I benefited greatly from the experience, except for the wounds in my legs. I met bright draftees and matured and knew what I wanted as a result of this experience. I regret missing tonight, but I feel strongly about our nation's military, and I think we all have an obligation to serve if able. Warm regards, George. Well, I served in the Navy from uh, 1961 to 1966, and I would do it over again if I had the opportunity. Now, back in 1956 or 57, when I was starting to think about college and so forth and so on, and this was, we, we did have a draft uh, at, that, at that time. And it was my father, actually, who said to me, he said, you know, it'd be much more uh, comfortable to be in the service as an officer than as a listed man. And he said, you might think about ROTC programs uh, at college. And in fact, the Navy has a scholarship program uh, that will help pay for your tuition, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought that was a pretty good idea. Um, and I ended up applying at Dartmouth. I ended up applying for the NROTC scholarship program. And then if you happen to get selected by both of those, then you also have to figure out whether you get into the particular unit at Dartmouth. In other words, I could have gotten accepted to Dartmouth, I could have gotten accepted into the Navy uh, scholarship program, but not into the Dartmouth unit. And I had decided, by the way, that if, that, if one of that came about, I would still come to Dartmouth and I would not go to the uh, Navy program. So I, I came here in 1957 and uh, spent four years uh, with, in the ROTC program. And each summer, we, we spent uh, the summer, about eight weeks each summer, on a, a cruise, and the first, first summer between freshman and sophomore years was a cruise, and the second summer they indoctrinated us into the Marines and, and uh, Navy Air, and the third year I applied for uh, an opportunity to, to do a cruise on a submarine, which I got, and uh, that summer sold me on submarines as being uh, where I wanted to spend my short career. Now. When you apply for and go to a, a school like submarine school, which is a six months program, that means you get an additional obligated year of service. So instead of the four years obligated service that I had by going under the ROTC program, I had a, had a fifth year uh, in the submarines because of that. And I spent the, after six months at the submarine school in uh, Groton, Connecticut, spent two years out in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And that was a great way to spend a couple of years after you just graduated from college. And this was the beginning of the Vietnam era, but uh, I never saw any enemy combat during my five years. The, the big, one of the biggest things that happened during my five years was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, when Kennedy made his Cuban Missile speech in the fall of 62, uh, um, our submarine took off the opposite way. We, we were preparing to go out to the Western Pacific for a six-month tour, and we, we left the next day uh, ex for an extended tour, and we spent uh, the first month or so in the, Nor in the Korean Straits looking for Russian submarines coming out of Vladivostok. We never saw any. We saw lots of Korean fishermen. <laughs> but th this is just slightly off topic, but I, w I thought since we're talking about service and war. Uh, when we were in Hawaii, they were still conducting um, atomic bomb tests. And this one particular night, and it was in the summer, 3,000 miles away out in one of those atolls out in the Western Pacific, they were going to uh, set off an atomic bomb. And we were told that, you know, you ought to be outside to watch this thing. And we lived in naval housing. Well, it was 3,000 miles, not much chance of radiation. but. We went up on top of our naval housing building, which is a flat roof, and we were standing around 
joking and stuff like that. It was, it was pretty dark that night. And suddenly there was no sound, but suddenly the sky lit up and it was like broad daylight. And this bomb had gone off 3,000 miles away and everybody just stopped talking and stood around in awe. And the next morning the Honolulu uh, newspaper showed a picture of Waikiki Beach and looked just like middle of the day. Um, from there I got orders to, uh, to go to the Polaris Missile Weapons School. I was trained there and supposed to go aboard one of the uh, Polaris uh, missile submarines. And during the course of, at that school, I got called up for nuclear power. Now, at that time, I was on a diesel electric submarine, but the nuclear power submarines were coming off the line pretty fast and furious at that time, and, and the nuclear subs at that time uh, had a lot of engineering problems. They were, as we said, they were more in port than they were out at sea because they were getting repaired. But also, the submarines were coming off the line faster than they could get uh, uh, officers enlisted people to man those submarines. And like submarine service, which a was a volunteer service, nuclear power at that time was also volunteer. Uh, but uh, Hyman Rickover wasn't getting enough officers, so he decided that if you were, had volunteered for a submarine, you were a volunteer for any type of submarine, and so he just called people in for, um, for nuclear power. Now, had I planned to sta stay in the Navy for a career, that was the only way to go because uh, they were phasing out the diesel electric subs and, and it's an all nuclear submarine navy now. Um, and unfortunately I got accepted into the uh, nuclear program and that was, that was a downer for a couple of reasons. Number one, I, I had not planned to make a career of the navy and wanted to get out after my five years. But again, the, this two for one rule, if I had gone to nuclear power training, which was a year's program, I would have added two more years to my obligated service. Plus, what I liked about submarine was the operations side, you know, the up periscope, down periscope of John Wayne fame, and, and not so much the engineering. Um, so uh, through some finagling, I was able not to go to nuclear power school, but went back to the Polaris Missile Weapons School as an instructor, and that's where I spent the last two years uh, in, in the Navy. As I look back upon that experience, um, as I said, I would do it over again. On the downside, uh, because I was here taking ROTC courses, we had to take two courses each year, so eight courses. Those were eight courses that I could have taken other, in other departments at Dartmouth and was prevented from doing so. And, and I've, I've kind of regretted that over the course of time. But, uh, I'm not sure I would agree with George Demko that we ought to have mandatory military uh, service, but I would be much in favor of a two-year service obligation, whether it's military or in some other capacity, whether it's AmeriCorps or Peace Corps or something of that sort. And I know that, um, and I don't remember if it was in the 70s or early 80s when there was a lot, the students on campus here were, were um, very upset with the ROTC and, and pretty much forced it off campus. And I have ambivalent feelings about that. On the one hand, I mean, I understand uh, where they were coming from. On the other hand, uh, I think it's good that uh, a good part of our military officers, whether it's Navy, Army, Marines, or Air Force, come from liberal arts colleges like Dartmouth College. And by doing away with those programs on this campus, we don't have that uh, opportunity. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. I think I go next. Uh, I served on active duty from 1983 to 1986, and then I was a reservist in a variety of different capacities for 15 years, uh, resigning my commission in 2003. When I graduated from high school in 1979, I was an all-state math team kid. I was on the all-county chess team. I'd been cut from every single sports team I tried out for in high school. I tried out for a team, four teams a year. My father had played lacrosse at Harvard, and I desperately did not want to be an intellectual. I wanted to be a jock, and I was lousy at it. <laughs> I went to the University of Chicago in the fall of 1979. I was 17 years old. Um, Animal House had just sort of 
breach the movie theaters. And I showed up, I was incredibly immature. Um, I lasted there through one quarter and then was asked to leave. <laughs> I worked in a factory making dental office furniture for six months. It was an illuminating experience. <laughs> <clears throat> I transferred to Cornell University. Um, I tried out for the men's crew and I was cut. Uh, I then majored in boozing, drugging, unsuccessfully chasing women. I think the two may have been correlated. <laughs> After two years of that, I was expelled from Cornell University. Um, my parents were understandably livid. Second time around, uh, my father basically said he wanted nothing to do with me. I got a job working as a dishwasher in a restaurant. Coincidentally, spending a lot of time watching television, I saw an ad. This was the beginnings of the Be All You Can Be campaign. <laughs> and it also happened to be at the beginning of the Reagan arms buildup. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was committed to expanding the size of the special forces community. And so for a brief period of time then, as is the case today, someone right off the street could walk in and volunteer to be a special forces soldier. And I saw this ad with pictures of guys going down slick ropes on helicopters, people jumping out of helicopters with, at 30,000 feet, not 1,000 feet. I saw guys jumping out of helicopters into the ocean. I said, wow, that looks cool. <laughs> I could do that. And my friend next to me said, are you insane? You're six feet three inches tall. You weigh 145 pounds. <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> I had hair down to here. I enlisted. Um, the next three years were the hardest three years of my life before and since. I went to basic training for 10 weeks. I think the experience that Gene and I had was prob and George was probably had not changed much in 40 years. We lived in World War II barracks. The training manuals had not changed a lick. I went to infantry school for another six weeks period. I went to jump school for another four weeks period. I went to special forces school that began with a three month long, what was referred to as pre-phase training. Uh, because they had changed the rules and let in all these people off the street, the regular special forces guys were inundated with rubes like myself. And they were not happy about it. And so they made every effort possible to get us to quit. So for three months, they got us up six days a week at 5 a.m. We had PT training all day long. And then in the afternoon, we had classes. And then we had PT at night. And it was an eye opener, having somebody scream at me, telling me, and this is after basic training and after jump school, but these people seemed like they really meant it, that they didn't want me there. <laughs> and well, because before you can always say, oh, this is part of the charade. They need me here. If I don't get through basic training, they're going to be in trouble. But these guys actually told us they hoped and wanted 90% of us to fail. It was brutal. I then ended up in the, what's referred to as the Special Forces uh, Qualification Course. And this is a long process, it takes several months. The first month of which was going fabulously until the hand-to-hand -hand combat pit, I tore all the cartilage in my knee. I had to go to have surgery. This was actually a beneficial moment. It was the best time of my life. I ended up living in a trailer park in Spring Lake, North Carolina. I had a roommate. We lived together for six weeks. He then met the woman of his dreams, went AWOL, married her, and was gone. <laughs> At that point, I had not been an enthusiastic member of the United States military. I had, in fact, tried nefarious ways to figure out if there was a way I could get out of my contract. I realized that I was in way over my head. There were people there that wanted to be there, that belonged there. I was only there because I had run out of options. I was the spoiled, rich, smart kid that had basically ruined all the opportunities. And here I was, with my leg in a cast, barely able to take care of myself in a trailer park in the middle of North Carolina, not knowing what to do. <clears throat> my mother sent me a book by a, a philosopher, a guy named Eric Hoffer. He's a longshoreman turned philosopher. And he talked about true believers. And I decided I had to figure out what it is that I believed in. And I decided over that six week period while I was convalescing that if I couldn't, nobody else believed in me. But so if no one was going to believe in me, I probably ought to because then otherwise it would be a population of zero. 
that cared about me. So I decided I would, in fact, try and get through the Special Forces School, and I did over the course of the next year. I remember vividly moments lying in the sand and the heat with every day they would drive a truck up. The part that I remember most was the physical exhaustion of being kept awake day after day after day. They would bring in shifts of guys every eight hours. They would bring in new TAC officers to keep us awake so that we couldn't rest. And I remember wanting to quit. And I had, there was a, a gentleman I met, a guy named Jim Lauder. He was from a town called Ramsour, North Carolina. There were 50 people in his town. He hadn't graduated from high school. He's one of the most incredible human beings I've ever met in my life. And every morning, they would show up with his truck and say, look, if you want hot breakfast, we'll give you a hot breakfast. You can get on the truck and you'll be done. Or you can stay and have another day with us. And I just said, God, Jim, you know, this just sucks. This is not worth it. And he said, Al, think about how much energy it will take to stand up and walk over to the truck. <laughs> If you stay with me one more day, I will keep my eye out for you right now so you can sleep for 15 minutes. So it's your choice, Al. Get up and walk or take a nap. <laughs> and being the short-term rationalist I was, I took a nap every morning. And this went on for 10 days. I got through that school. I ended up on a Special Forces A team. They had just come back from Lebanon, and so we were on a sort of down cycle which meant we got more training. I was then sent to a counterterrorism school back in North Carolina for another four months. I was then ended up back on the team, and in the mail arrived a piece of paper, serendipitously strangely from the Army, offering me a two-year scholarship to go back to college. At that point, I had been accepted into a high-altitude jump school and scuba school en route in Key West, Florida. After that, I was then scheduled to spend two years in Monterey, California, learning Polish. You know, it's these strange, the Army presents the strangest choices. <laughs> I decided to get out of the Army at that point. Um, I looked at the men on my Special Forces team and I saw people that were in their late 30s and early 40s that were worn out. Their physically had been not destroyed but broken down. The expression used hard and put up wet would not be inappropriate. So I went back to college on an ROTC scholarship. Uh, I then spent, after graduating from college, I went for the, the Armor Officer's basic course down in Fort Knox. I totally dug it. It turned out I liked the big machine. I liked the 120 millimeter pistol. <laughs> it is awesome driving along at 30 miles an hour and telling the guy sitting between your legs, fire. And the whole <laughs> machine rocks back. It's just. I just can't tell you, it's pretty cool. And so I was offered a regular Army commission, and I said, well, you know, I'm in graduate school now. I need a two-year deferment to finish my PhD. And they said, oh, we can't do that. And I said, well, that's crazy. Two years ago, you said I could have a two-year deferment to go to business school. Now I can't have two years to finish a PhD? They said, it's not in our plan. I said, where's the flexibility? I would totally love this now. I'm into it. They said, nope, it's not part of the plan. So I said, well, fine, I'll go back and get my PhD. So I ended up being a professor, did a bunch of different jobs in the reserves, all kinds of incredibly tedious things in the reserves. Um, in 1991, there was a war. Um, I was an armor officer in Michigan serving in an armor battalion. Our unit was mobilized for eight weeks. We were sent to Camp Grayling in Michigan. To be able to fight in an armor battalion, you're Companies have to be able to qualify. They have a gunnery range. It's like a target practice for armored vehicles. And you have to be able to basically demonstrate that your unit has mastered the most basic of basic skills. Two platoons in our entire battalion passed the exam. They sent us for further training in Mississippi for another two months because it was kind of embarrassing. You know, the National Guard can't qualify to be sent to Iraq to fight in the war. And at this point, one of my uh, running buddies and I, we decided we'd resign our commissions and volunteer to go back into the Special Forces and the Rangers, respectively. The governor of Michigan refused to accept our resignations. He said, it's not in the interest of the Army. I said, oh, all right, I guess that's the way it's going to go. So in the end, we never went to Iraq. We were deemed incompetent. <laughs> I figured I'd dodge the bullet, <laughs> literally. A few years later, 
In 2003, I was a professor at Dartmouth, and I received a call from a gentleman in Missouri. It's where the Army's personnel management system resides. And he said, uh, Captain Stam, have we got a job for you? I said, oh, this is it, finally. <laughs> so you got to imagine, you have to remember, I've spent four years of my life, I'm 45 years old, I've spent 10% of my entire life training six or seven days a week, 60, 80, 120 hours a week to do the job. I thought the phone was ringing for me to go do the job. I was thrilled. My wife was extraordinarily nervous. He explained to me that there was going to be a short war <laughs> and that they needed to have a sort of a, a, a bring folks up to speed clinic in Kuwait for the armored troops that were being sent to Iraq. And what they would do is they would take all the soldiers from Fort Knox, people that were the trainers there, Fort Knox, the armor school, send them to Kuwait, and they needed some folks to run the armor school for all the people coming out of college. And this guy said, he's very flattering. These people are very seductive. They said, now we have here, we understand that uh, you're the distinguished graduate from your armor class. We're calling all the distinguished armor graduates around the country that are in the reserves. And we're going to impose upon your sense of service and obligation to America to come back and help us in our time of need. And I said, well, Major, I've been to Fort Knox. I've been to Louisiana. I've been to North Carolina. I've been to Georgia. I've been to South Carolina, Minnesota, the Cape Cod, Mississippi, Alabama. I have no desire to go back to Kentucky. I lived there for six months. If you'll send me to Kuwait, if you'll send me to Dubai, if you'll send me to Iraq, to Gutter, to the UAR, any of these places, I would be happy to go. If you want me to resign my commission, I will go as a Special Forces radio operator. He said, son, it's not deemed in the mission of the Army. It's not in our interest to have you go. I said, well, you know what, sir, then? If you could do me a small favor and send me the paperwork so I could resign my commission, I'd be much obliged. Now, the Army, in my experience, <clears throat> does nothing efficiently. It took me a year and a half for my enlistment to be, pro pro to be processed. The next day, I got a FedEx letter to resign my commission. Signed it, sent it in, and that was that. That was the end of my military career. Now, when George and I actually went back and forth a couple of emails, and um, I disagree with George almost passionately about obli obligatory service. Serving in the military transformed me. It changed me from a spoiled, arrogant, close to useless human being into somebody that every single day, literally every day I wake up and I think about those experiences and I thank my lucky stars that somehow somebody put me in a situation where I was contractually obliged to not quit, where I had to keep going. And I thank my lucky stars literally every day for Jim Lauder, that if I hadn't met that guy, I would have quit. And I would have ended up a really angry PFC in the infantry in Korea, which, you know, could be worse changed George Danko's life. But for me, if I'd been forced to do all those things, or forced to even try to do those things, the lessons never would have stuck. For me, it was somehow that serendipitous moment, lying there on the living room floor in a trailer in Spring Lake, North Carolina, realizing that nobody was going to take care of myself but me, that transformed my life. And I think that if we force our young people to do things that would be wildly unpopular, most many of them, that I think we would actually end up doing more harm than good. And I'm sorry for speaking so long. Turn it over to Rich. Hi, my name is uh, Rich Morales, and I had the great pleasure of uh, being Al's uh, teaching assistant, which is a fascinating experience. As you can tell, at Yale, Al was a rock star, uh, and he certainly enjoyed uh... Could you use the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to do that. Uh, is that better? Sure. Maybe I just need to come through a little closer. Uh, I'm Rich Morales. I once TA'd for Al. I'm glad to be here. Uh, <laughs> this has been a fascinating experience just to sit here and listen to the fellow panelists. And my wife and I arrived last night. We were, Al and his wife, Cindy, were kind enough to have us for dinner. And we've spent some time here in Hanover. 
uh, just walking and getting to see and, and meet some folks here has been an, just a fascinating experience. Folks have, you know, of course, very, very uh, friendly have asked, so what are you doing here? And invariably, we talk about the panel. And I had uh, a, a lady, Susan, who uh, works at a computer store today, said, hey, I, I'm not sure that that's such a good idea. I think people may throw things at you. I said, well, I, I hope to have a conversation and be part of a panel that, uh, you know, the stated purpose here is not to sort of flog the serving army guy. Uh, but I, I am very grateful to be here. I, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the nature of my service. Uh, and then I think I'm Wes's uh, warm-up act. Wes is a fascinating individual. My connection to Dartmouth, uh, as, as Al said, I'm not a, a Dartmouth graduate. Uh, I graduated from West Point and then uh, from Yale. My dean at the business school at Yale, Jeff Garden, is a Dartmouth grad. And I, what I found uh, was interesting is that he used to get the military uh, veterans together every Thursday. And if you wanted to show up, you did, and he bought you a beer. Uh, and, he, and he told stories of his experiences in Vietnam as a Special Forces A-Team captain. And here's a guy who, uh, either by looking at him, uh, and certainly uh, nothing in his resume mentioned that he had spent any time in the military, but he had a, a deep sense of uh, commitment to his military service and certainly uh, shared that with us. Uh, most, more recently, my connection to a Dartmouth graduate is Melissa Hammerly. She was a captain that, you know, probably the reason I'm here, she wasn't able to go, she, she wasn't able to come here uh, this particular day. I think she is vacationing down in Costa Rica, which is a smart place for, for that captain to be, given that she just spent 14 months uh, deployed to Iraq. We served together in the same brigade in Iraq. And I'll tell you a little bit about Melissa Hammerly. She's a military intelligence officer who is brilliant and provided unbelievable uh, tactical intelligence and an ability to, to synergize a whole lot of uh, information and bring it together to produce some great results. And she is a, really a star uh, product of Dartmouth, and, and it was my pleasure to get to work with her. Uh, a little on, on me, I'm married to Christy, who is in the audience. We met in kindergarten, and she has put up with this crazy uh, military lifestyle that uh, we have elected to be part of, and much like Al and uh, I don't know what the other views of the panelists are. I, I, I do not favor George's view of compulsory military service. P for purely selfish interests, it would be much more difficult to lead people who don't voluntarily want to be in the predicaments that we put ourselves in. And secondly, uh, there's something very unique and special about a volunteer force. I, I do think there is a, a gap between the military and the society that we serve, but I think that the situation that we have now and and uh, is much better to, and I did not uh, live the Vietnam experience, but I think that the, the quality of soldier, uh, officer, leader, and non-commissioned officer that we get uh, is excellent. Uh, so to, to change that, uh, sort of that calculus there, uh, in my opinion, would be a, a big mistake. And there, I, I don't want a militarized society, although I, I myself chose to, to serve in the military. Uh, I've spent 17 years in uniform. I, was an, I'm an, I am an armor officer. I am going to Germany where I'll command a tank battalion. I've spent uh, five tours in combat, uh, three of them in Iraq. I will be back in Iraq in November. Uh, I had the opportunity to do UN peacekeeping back when I was a captain, and I had a full head of hair. This, this business tends to uh, wear you down. Uh, so I have had a variety of... Uh, I think, interesting professional experiences. Aside from that, I think the common theme with the panelists here are those professional or personal contacts. Uh, the depth of the friendships that we have made uh, in uniform is, is unbelievable to me. Whether it be folks that chose to serve one tour, a lot of my uh, friends that uh, were lieutenants, people that I graduated West Point, uh, about 60% of my West Point class is out of the Army. Uh, they're either uh, investment banking, they're uh, doing all manner of things, <laughs> serving society in some cases, in some cases serving themselves. But uh, that experience of having that close camaraderie, whether it be with people that, are, that choose to serve for, for what seems like a lifetime, 17 years, or people that, uh, as, as young officers uh, like Wes, who you'll hear from in a minute, uh, believe that this is the right thing to do for them. 
Uh, so, so that is something that I'm extremely uh, thankful for. The military has also provided uh, Christy and I, and I say Christy and I because we, we both go through this experience uh, together, uh, a number of unique opportunities. One of them was the opportunity to study uh, at, at uh, receive a graduate degree and then go back to teach at West Point, where uh, having been a graduate of West Point, uh, have that opportunity to share with uh, cadets who have at an early age have decided to make a commitment to the military, uh, try to broaden their horizons. And, and uh, Susan, who I met today at the computer store, who said, well, I think it's kind of a waste that uh, you are a, a Yale graduate and you'd be running around on tanks in the front, on the front lines. Uh, can you explain why the Army would do that? Why wouldn't they put you in the Pentagon where they could use your brain power? I mean, anybody can lead soldiers uh, down the streets of Baghdad. And it was a great conversation because she certainly didn't mean it as a poke in the eye. And, and, it, and again, this gap that I'm talking about between the society we serve in the military, uh, what I said is that one of the reasons why I, I absolutely wanted to go to Yale is I wanted to experience something very different than what my undergraduate experience had, had been. Uh, I went to West Point. If you all have a sense for what that might be like. It's military school. Uh, so I wanted to do something different where I, I, I grew a beard, I rode on the crew team, another connection that, that Al and I had, and I spent two years with people that were very, very, very different uh, than me, perhaps politically, but as it turned out, weren't different from, from Christy or I at all in terms of how they looked at uh, some of the most basic things in life. They were great people. Uh, I enjoyed the conversations. I enjoyed the discussions. I enjoyed the debate. I changed my views on some things. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I was successful in changing their views and other things, but it wasn't this competition to see who could win as much as it was a, a discussion and a conversation with people with very different views. And I found that very, very beneficial. And I enjoyed going back to West Point to, to push cadets to challenge them to say, hey, you're, we're not going to teach you how to, how to think, uh, or we're not going to teach you what, what to think, but how to think. Uh, not an uncommon proposition in colleges and universities anywhere uh, across this country. But I think it's very important to have a diversified military. And when I say diversified, I don't necessarily just mean diversification of education, but backgrounds and experiences. And another thing that I think that the volunteer military brings us. Uh, I've been to Iraq twice in the last uh, three years, each time for over a year, going back for 14 months. Uh, I'm not a sadist, but it's a difficult road, especially for my wife, I think, to, to worry about uh, my safety and the, the safety of the 600 people that, that will work for me. Uh, but it is very important in a time where, where this is a, a unpopular war, we can discuss the merits or, or, or uh, failings of that war, but more importantly, what I want to provide you is that sense. Uh, and also the sense of who serves. Uh, this. Uh, two years ago, uh, one of our best company commanders, George Wood, a Cornell graduate, uh, was killed in Iraq. Uh, it is not just, uh, I mean, is folks like Wes who make a decision that, that leave Dartmouth, leave Cornell, leave Yale, leave Harvard, uh, and I use the Ivies just sort of as, a, as an example of what is uh, a cross-section. Is it a perfect cross-section? Of course not. Uh, are Ivy Leagues overrepresented in the, in the military? No. But there are uh, people who choose to make that decision. Another thing that, that uh, going back a little uh, to my experience at Yale, is what I learned at Yale is there's also certainly other ways to serve. I have classmates that have given up on making a whole ton of money, are making not a whole lot of money by business school standards, and are really devoting themselves to causes that make this world better. Uh, and, and, and as an Army guy, where it's easy to perhaps kind of blur uh, things and think, well, at the end of the day, my job is to kill people, which is not. Uh, it's certainly a part of it. Um, it really is great to know people who have this passion for things that make this world better. And really that, in, in, in kind of wrapping up perhaps why I serve, I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself. Uh, I wanted to serve my country, uh, and I know that sounds corny and maybe even cornier during these uh, troubled times, but I think that in that area and, and that span of control that I am able to influence, uh, I think that I'm able to make a difference uh, by devoting myself to, to our soldiers and trying to uh, fight this war with all the tools, this and any other war, with all the tools uh, and all the 
the moral courage to do the right thing. And sometimes the right thing uh, puts our soldiers in a position where it's much harder uh, not to pull the trigger than it is to pull the trigger. And I think that is my responsibility as an Army leader to train our soldiers to follow the laws of, uh, uh, of land warfare and to try to uh, bring some humanity to an otherwise very, very difficult to understand, explain uh, situation. So those are my thoughts on uh, military service. Uh, Again, I just wanted to, to thank Al for inviting me here, and I wanted to turn it over to Wes, and I'm looking forward to any type of conversation or questions you may have. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it's no. good. No? no? A little better? OK. Uh, my name's Wes Lippman. I graduated here uh, from Dartmouth in 2003. Um, <clears throat> I have some notes here. so. Please just bear with me. Uh, I'm going to start out. I'll just tell you guys kind of my experience, uh, a timeline, um, history of my experience in the military and the Marine Corps. I graduated in 03 and spent about uh, a little over six months trying to find a job. I had done internships in commercial real estate and thought that that was probably something I would like to do as a career. So uh, I finally landed one. I grew up in Darien, Connecticut, just outside of New York City. I got a job in Stanford, Connecticut with a commercial, a large commercial real estate firm, and I worked there for just under about under a year. Uh, I very much enjoyed the job. I thought it was great. Uh, that being said, it was not at all what I was looking for at the time, and I slowly came to that realization. Well, when I was at school, um, joining the military was probably one of the furthest things from my mind. I was at a pretty healthy respect for it, but there's people who, you know, at age five are out playing G.I. Joe and know from, you know, their parents were in the Marine Corps or in the Army, and their grandparents were, and they know from a young age that that's something they want to do. Um, that was not the case with me. I kind of came to it later in life, I guess you would say. Um, anyway, I, in the fall of 2004, about a year, a little over a year after I graduated, I slowly came to that decision, so I went over to the Intrepid in Manhattan and walked in and talked to the Marine Corps recruiter, the uh, officer recruiter, said, I'd like to do this. So I went through you know, all the uh, pre-training and the, the physical screening and all that and was accepted. And so I went to officer candidate school for the Marine Corps in the January of 2005. And to a certain extent, you can kind of guess what you're getting into. I mean, you know from movies, from talking to people, what, what it's all about, but there's really no way of describing it until you get there. And I think anyone here can attest that it's, it's pretty miserable. <laughs> um, it's a 10-week program, and as they like to say, it's more or less a 10-week interview process. Uh, they take it very, very seriously. I'm sure in all the branches, again, most of what I can speak to is just with the Marine Corps, but uh, they take it very seriously. If you're gonna be out there leading Marines, especially in battle, um, they wanna know that you're able to do it you know, mentally, mentally, physically, psychologically, the whole thing. And they place a very, very high emphasis on leadership. Um, in fact, they, they're very proud of this story. Um, they always talk about how they have a program, a group of kids from Wharton Business School um, down in UPenn come for, I think it's about a week. And they always, they, they really enjoy talking about it because you have these, these sergeant instructors and drill sergeants out there running around a bunch of MBAs from Wharton. And they're always very amazed at how the people who come from Wharton are always, uh, they place a very, very high emphasis on consensus and on having meetings and speaking with people and getting everyone's opinion. At OCS, that's not what they teach you. And I think, at least with my generation, I, I think that it might seem that the leadership aspect is something that comes naturally and you have to work towards consensus. I would actually argue it's different. I think most people feel much more comfortable in a group of seven or 10 people um, bouncing ideas off each other, trying to figure it out. It takes a little bit of the responsibility off your shoulders and you know, places a shared burden on everyone. Um, at OCS, they, they don't do that. They throw you into a situation, always uncomfortable, physically, mentally, everything. And they say, you're in charge. You have to lead your peers. Go do it. And 
I, I don't. I mean, I don't care how much of a born leader you are. That it's awkward at first, and it's very, very, you know, nerve rattling and intimidating. But it, it works. I mean, it's been working for a long time, many, many years. It's probably very, very similar now to how it was in World War II in Vietnam, um, the actual ten-week program. Anyway, so that's just to kind of give a, an idea of what what they really stress at the beginning, and they make it abundantly clear. But that's pretty, it's pretty bad, you're out there. Um, I went in the winter, and it's down in Quantico, Virginia, so it's extremely cold. Um, I just have a lot of memories of standing outside for hours and hours and hours, just freezing. Um, there's a nice little thing called the Quigley, which is basically a, a water and mud route that you do. You jump in and swim through it, and uh, they, they go out and break the ice with sledgehammers before you go in, and they test it out. And I was waiting, and the first three people in front of me all got pulled out with hypothermia, shaking, and had no idea where they were. So <laughs> I was a little nervous to go do that, but you know, we made it through okay, not a problem. Anyway, after that, um, they have a fairly high attrition rate. I think it was about almost 25% of the people dropped out um, out of about, I think there were just over 200 people in my class. Uh, you go to, this is where the Marine Corps, at least on the officer side, differs a little bit from the other branches. You go, every single Marine Corps officer goes to the basic school, uh, which is also in Quantico, Virginia, and that's a six month course that ostensibly anyone who graduates from that can lead a uh, Marine infantry platoon, be a platoon commander. Uh, so you learn the basics of infantry, as well as other things, um, general, officership qualities, some of the paperwork, administration stuff. And even though you've been commissioned as a second lieutenant, the whole place is run by mostly majors and captains. And there's 200 second lieutenants running around like chickens with their head cut off, have no idea what to do, getting lost in the woods. So you're not quite treated as an officer just yet, um, even though technically you are one. And that's probably more so than OCS. Um, I would say one of the more difficult things at every stage in the, in the journey, um, it's always difficult, it just, there's different emphasis placed on different things. Um, a lot of the officer candidate school part was physical. Uh, the basic school is very much physical, but also very much mental. And again, they give you billets and you're in charge of your platoon. So it's a 35 other second lieutenants and you're trying to tell them what to do. And um, obviously that causes a lot of contention sometimes. But the thinking is if you can lead 35 of your lieutenants and your peers when you actually have enlisted men underneath you and women. Um, it's all that much easier to lead them when you really have to. Uh, after doing that, I graduated from there in about October of 2005. And you get a MOS, a military occupational specialty. And there's about 25 available to officers. Infantry is a very popular one, especially in the Marine Corps. Uh, the pilots who are also required to go through all this, go and they go to flight school. I was, uh, I was assigned to being a, a logistics officer, uh, which is a very broad MOS. It encompasses a lot of things. I found out that I'd be going to Camp Pendleton, which was great, fine by me. It's out near San Diego, great place to live, um, <clears throat> to be a motor transport officer, basically in charge of the motor pool. So the Humvees, the trucks that you use to transport all the cargo around Iraq, and um, that's about it. A few other different kinds of modified trucks. Before that, you go to 10-week logistics officers course. And um, I know, first of all, let me say, I know it can be a little confusing if you're not in the military, all the acronyms and schools and everything. So I'll try and keep it very basic. But they basically just give you 10 weeks of an overview of how to be a logistics officer um, you know, with dubious results. I mean, you cover a wide array of things, and you're really not going to learn too much until you're actually on the job. Um, so then I did that, and in about March of last year, um, I finally got out to Camp Pendleton and got assigned to my unit and picked up my platoon, which is actually a very, very big deal. Uh, it's kind of what you've been waiting for and what you've been training for for over a year. And obviously, again, a very pretty nerve-wracking experience because they know right off the bat that you're a brand new second lieutenant and you have a bunch of guys who've been to Iraq two, three, sometimes even four times, and they know you haven't. And they know that you may know some things, but they know a lot, a lot of other things. 
you know, how things actually work behind the scenes. So you rely heavily on them. And that's, you know, one aspect of, of the training that, that you go through that I think is very, very important. It's not that they teach you to be a leader and to override everyone's decision and to just tell people what to do. But they teach you to be a leader in the sense that ultimately you bear all the responsibility for any actions taken or any decision taken. However, you have to lean on your people underneath you and you have to rely on their expertise and you have to get their input. It's just that you act as the one filter and you come to a consolidated decision on that. So I think that's you know, pretty important. And I, the lieutenants, in my experience, which is obviously limited, the lieutenants that do well are the ones that are willing to admit, hey, I need some help and they rely heavily on their guys. And the ones who do poorly and who end up actually commanding little to no respect from their guys are the ones that think they know everything and start bossing people around right off the bat. But again, it's all, it's all different leadership styles, and that's part of the beauty of it too, is it lets you come to your own leadership style. Um, anyway, so I picked up my, my platoon, and there are three other platoons, uh, truck platoons. We trained as a company and as a battalion for all of the spring of 2006 and all of the summer. We went to Iraq in August of 2006, and we were located at Al-Assad, which is out in Al-Ambar province out west. Um, our main mission, I was the convoy commander, so whenever I went on the road, I was in charge of these convoys, usually between anywhere from 40 to 60 vehicles. Uh, a lot of civilian contractors, Kellogg Brown route contractors, um, you know, Division of Halliburton, they carried a lot of our stuff, the idea being to get fewer Marines on the road and more contractors who were you know, willing to do it and freeing us up to do other things. Um, our main mission was to run logistics convoys and resupply convoys to three other bases. Ours was a very big base, an air base, so they would fly supplies in. We would load them up on trucks and take these convoys out there. Um, it's a very, very weird experience. Everyone thinks of Iraq today, especially as cities, which a lot of it is. Um, places like Ramadi and Fallujah and Baghdad, house to house fighting, clearing rooms, you know, out on patrols, on foot patrols. That is a big part of it. That was not what I did. I, ours was almost all mounted. We very rarely got out of our vehicles unless we had to. And, you know, you could go for two or three convoys and, and it would be fine. Nothing would happen. You wouldn't see anyone. You wouldn't have any IEDs, you wouldn't find anything. And it would be sometimes hard, especially when you're in charge, to really make sure everyone maintains that focus because at any second, you know, things can go wrong. Other times you go out and get hit by IEDs left and right um, or see people filming us, or things like that. So that, I think in a sense, psychologically, is uh, in some ways harder than actually you know, having an enemy in front of you fighting him, knowing where he is, facing him. And the guys in, in the cities deal with the same thing, just on a, on a lesser level. I mean, our main weapon, or our, the main enemy that we were fighting out there was, was IEDs, these improvised explosive devices, um, you know, roadside bombs. Uh, that was really being in convoys, the, by far um, our biggest, the thing that hurt us most. We ran a bunch of convoys, we went to up near the Syrian border, out near the Jordanian border. And in, at the end of September, on September 30th, we were coming back from Al-Qaim. And you know, things had been going very smoothly all day. And we, came, we were pretty close to Al-Assad, about I'd say 10 or 20 miles away, and came to a bridge uh, crossing over a wadi, a, a dried out riverbed. And this was a bridge that the uh, engineers, the US engineers had constructed really solid bridge, it looks almost like any you know, highway bridge up here. And they had placed a pressure-induced IED underneath the bridge up in the kind of the beams and the rafters of it, um, meaning that they, didn't, they don't have to be there. The pressure, pressure-oriented IEDs, you roll over it, and the pressure ignites a spark or whatever that um, completes the circuit and sets this thing off. They also have remote detonated where they do it with a, some sort of you know, a garage opener, a doorbell, anything. Um, they had planted a very large one underneath this bridge and I had sent scouts underneath the bridge as we always did to check and see if, uh, 
you know, just they make sure everything's okay before I bring 60 vehicles across. Uh, they had, the insurgents had hidden it so well that they didn't see anything as they drove around and underneath. And so they called from the other side and said, the bridge is all clear. So I told my driver to go across. As soon as we hit the bridge, um, we hit this IED and set it off. And it was, it, even by the standards out there, it was probably one of the larger ones I'd heard of or seen. It was, uh, they, they're not positive on the report, but they think that it was about 35 or 40 pounds of TNT and at least two artillery rounds, 155 uh, artillery shells, which are about weren't that. Um, so it was a pretty bad explosion. We were in an up armored Humvee, which they pretty much all are now. You're not allowed to go on the road without them. So that probably ended up saving us. Um, it sent our Humvee way up in the air, you know, about probably about 15 or 20 feet up in the air, flipped over backwards and landed. We didn't have a turret gunner at the time or else he definitely would have died. Uh, Humvee landed, the whole front's destroyed. Um, I actually bore the worst of the injuries. The, my driver had uh, some neck injuries that he was flown back to the United States for and had multiple surgeries, and he has a little bit of limited neck mobility, but he's back at work, and he's, he's doing pretty well. The naval corpsman in the back, the doctor, and the radio operator in the back were both wearing their seatbelts, and they were trapped in this thing upside down. So it took them a while to wriggle free. Uh, I wasn't wearing a seatbelt for, I, I personally didn't like wearing them. We were never going all that fast. And uh, I, I like the mobility of not having one on. And I, it may or may not have saved me or at least, you know, limited my injuries. I'm not sure. But my seat was ejected um, at some point. So it was pretty much a hole where I was sitting. Uh, and I woke up on the, on the side, you know, on the bridge probably a few seconds after this, maybe 10 or 30 seconds after. Um, the radio operator and the corpsman ended up finishing their tours over there. I mean, they literally walked away from this thing, which is, I find, utterly amazing. Um, my injuries were pretty bad. I, just to go into them briefly, I spent, um, well, it's actually a pretty interesting process, and I know they've done specials on TV about it, but the people that facilitate getting injured people from the battlefield back to the United States, the entire process is really pretty fascinating. And the people that do it are just, you know, utterly professional. But uh, we called a, a medevac, a helicopter to come in. And <clears throat> I, you know, was injured pretty badly. I had a broken back. Um, both my feet were shattered. My arm was kind of twisted upside down the wrong way and bones were sticking out and uh, had a pretty big hole in my leg. So I was obviously not moving. Um, I spoke with my guys briefly, you know, gave them a few quick orders. I was trying to maintain whatever calm I could. Um, my radio operator, you know, called in a medevac and my guys took care of everything, put us on litters. The, the bird came in probably about 10 or 15 minutes later. Uh, they loaded us up took us back to Al-Assad where they had, it was a big enough base where they had a pretty good hospital, amazing doctors and a pretty, pretty, pretty large facility. Uh, they did what they could to fix things up. At that point, it gets really fuzzy for a few days, but they sent me on a helicopter to Baghdad, to uh, Balad Air, Air Base right outside Baghdad. Um, I was there, I think about a day, maybe a night and an early morning. Um, they didn't really do much. They'd done such a good job at Al-Assad that they didn't need to do anything. Uh, I was on a lot of drugs at the time. Um, they flew from there. They loaded us on a C-17 Air Force plane, which is basically a flying hospital room. They have um, you know, medical technicians on there, and people come in on stretchers and IVs, and it's, it's actually a pretty amazing thing. They flew, we took that from Baghdad to Germany to Lahnstuhl, and I was there for about, I think, four or five days, at which point I called home, told my parents what had happened. I, they had asked me before I went into surgery at outside if I wanted to do that. I said, no, I'd prefer to call them myself. So I guess it was probably about a day or two after it actually happened until anyone found out back home. Um, Germany was pretty bad. They do a lot of washout surgeries where they just kind of knock you out, and it's such a dirty place over there that... There's a lot of bacteria and stuff that are foreign that get into your 
your wounds, so they're really pretty serious about cleaning you out. From there, uh, took another C-17 on a nine-hour flight from Germany back to Bethesda Naval Hospital outside D.C., and was there for about three months just doing multiple surgeries and recovering and all that. And then uh, went to Tampa VA Hospital for about two weeks of physical therapy once I was good enough to be a little bit mobile. Um, I had an external fixator, which is a bunch of rods and pins going through my foot and, you know, lost a lot of weight and I was in a wheelchair for several months. Um, after that, uh, they let me fly home on convalescent leave to West Palm Beach, Florida, where my parents have moved um, as of about two years ago. And since about December, I've been there just recovering and, and convalescing and doing a lot of physical therapy, um, which is, you know, it's, it's turned out pretty well considering they were going to amputate at least one, if not both, my feet. Um, pretty glad they didn't because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it, it's still having some foot problems and broken, uh, you know, I limp a little bit, but really the doctors are extremely pleased and pretty amazed with how, how well the recovery is going. And, you know, they give me credit. I give them most of the credit. They really are pretty amazing guys and they do, they could be out in the, uh, in the private sector, probably making a lot of, lot more money than they make and they stay and do what they do um, and do it better than probably anyone in the country, even, you know, civilians included, because they're seeing things that, they're seeing injuries and, and just situations that don't occur in everyday life outside of a war. So they're kind of at the cutting edge of the technology, especially with orthopedics and um, head trauma. Anyway, so that's kind of the background on my story. Um, I guess the obvious question is why join? And I think unlike Professor Stam, I kind of came at it from a different end. I had a lot and wanted something else. I grew up in, in you know, a nice town in Connecticut I, very comfortably. I came to Dartmouth. I played lacrosse up here. Um, again, you know, I was pretty pleased with my job afterwards. I just had a very nagging feeling. Um, you know, what, why am I not doing this? I'm physically capable. I'm mentally capable. I think it's something very important um, to the country and to myself. The question kept coming up. You know, why am I not doing this? I should be doing this. I want to do this. It's scary, but I think I can handle it. Um, so there was that, you know, and I guess a lot of times I would question whether or not I can meet the challenge. And, like, I guess any stupid young young guy, you want to meet the challenge. It's presented to you. So um, that was there was definitely a pretty large personal aspect in things. Um, you know, that desire to, I guess, be for lack of a better term, well-rounded. Um, like probably a lot of other students at Dartmouth, I didn't have much of an idea of what went on in the military. Um, like I said, I always respected it and was pretty in awe of what those, you know, the, they were capable of doing and had done in the past. But I didn't know really much about it at all, technically, details-wise. So um, I went through the whole thing of, yeah, I never fired a, a rifle and they teach you and you learn and that's it, you know, and along with a lot of other stuff. I mean, you're out there in the woods with a compass and a few hours and you got boxes that are miles away in the woods that you have to find off, off your map. And I mean, there's times when you sit there and you say, what am I doing here? <laughs> this is ridiculous. I mean, how did I even end up here? But again, that's kind of the beauty of it. Sink or swim and you figure a way, you figure out a way to do it. Um, I guess there was also a little to a small extent, uh, a desire to kind of go off the beaten path. It's not a very common thing. Obviously, there are Dartmouth graduates that are in the military, and I'm actually f pretty good friends with several of them. Um, but overall, it's probably not something that's too common. I came across an interesting article the other day somewhere. Uh, basically, it was about Harvard in World War II boasting that they had by far the most officers. Uh, that were participating active duty in World War II at the time. And uh, it was just interesting to me that in 60 some odd years, a very different uh, perspective on things coming from the Ivy League. Um, I don't think they would probably be boasting about that now, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and I, again, you know, just that desire to do something different, 
one of my good friends, Jonathan Powell, is here today. And I think, interestingly enough, he actually went into the Peace Corps and went to Africa after school. And I think that, as, as strange as it may sound, a lot, of, uh, a lot of our reasons for doing it were probably very similar. Um, you know, not to go into New York or go to Boston and go into investment banking or be a trader or do real estate or whatever the, the common thing is, be a lawyer. There's time to do that later. And, you know, I kind of figured, well, that's always going to be there. And, you know, you always have it if you want it. But um, if, you, if you don't do this now, you're never going to do it. So I kind of decided to do it. And then also there's obviously probably the, the strongest reason is, you know, I kind of touched on it, but that sense of duty and, for, yeah, as cliched as it sound, I guess patriotism. Um, living near New York, 9-11 was pretty bad. You know, we knew some people as a family that, passed away in that, uh, in the Twin Towers, and, you know, that kind of hit home pretty personally for me, and, you know, that was always kind of in the background of it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say at all that it was, the, you know, the main reason I joined or anything like that, but it definitely put things in a new light and uh, kind of brought that, the whole aspect of this worldwide terrorism, um, the whole aspect of worldwide terrorism kind of brought it home to me personally. Um, <clears throat> I wrote a few notes on just some of the positive and negative things that I've, that I've kind of come up with on my experience in the military based on what I've done and based on just what I've seen with other people uh, around me. The leadership experience that you get, I think, uh, again, I can't speak to the other branches, but I'm sure it's very similar. But in the Marine Corps, as, as an officer, is, it's really unparalleled. I mean, there's, I can't think of another place at 24, 25 years old that you're in charge of 35 people's lives. I mean, really every aspect of it, in the most literal sense, um, you know, you're in a war. And if you make the wrong call or if you slack off or neglect your duties, you know, people will die. There are very, very serious consequences. Um, but also in another sense, in terms of, well, over there, but especially at home, you know, some of these guys are not as educated as as some of the officers are. And you really have to take a, a very proactive interest in their lives. They have marriage problems. A lot of them are married young. They have kid problems. They have money problems. They get in motorcycle accidents. They do stupid things out in town. And it's all your problem. It, it, you know, it's all thrown in your lap. And so I think that's it's a very maturing thing you know, to realize that you're kind of like a coach, a brother, a dad, a leader, uh, everything to these guys. And so if you, I, I took that very seriously because, you know, you develop a bond with, your, with the guys that are underneath you and you really want to help them out. And I think the best officers really do have that desire, genuine desire to really help their guys out. And if, if I can, if I made one positive impact on one of their lives, you know, then it was all worth it. I really can say that. Um, Going along with that, there is that sense of camaraderie uh, that was touched upon before. Uh, I can definitely, <clears throat> definitely uh, sympathize with that the loneliness part. I mean, I, there are times when you're running around for two days straight preparing for a convoy, and you know you're sitting tense in your Humvee for 12 hours doing this convoy, running things, and at the end, at night, you get to base and. Yeah, you know, you're not fraternizing with your guys. You go say hello and everything, but at the end of the day, you're sitting there by yourself, and it's just, you know, things slow down and stop, and you have some time for some self-reflection, and it, it, it can be very lonely. Um, there was a 99 graduate, Nate Fick, who wrote a book, One Bullet Away, who I'm sure some of you guys have heard of, but he also touches on that in that book, um, just going through kind of near-death experiences running through these towns and then just sitting there afterwards and says, you know, being, being an officer is sometimes the loneliest thing because all those guys are joking around and he's sitting there by himself just reflecting on how close he was to dying that day. So I think that does kind of play a factor. Um, yeah, and finally, just, you know, the positive aspects of, of doing it is you, you do see and do things that you would never do. Like I said, if you're a natural-born leader or not, they definitely hone those skills very well. And uh, you're forced to do things and that, that 
are not comfortable and you're forced out of your comfort zone, which is probably, you know, development wise, the best thing that, that you can do for anyone, whether they, you know, need it or not per se. And, you know, you see when else is anyone going to go to Iraq? I think, uh, that's another factor that probably played some part of my decision. And also that, that you realize more and more as you're there is you're at the, you're in the central focus of the world. I mean, literally it sounds kind of crazy, but not even you, I mean, your guys, you have an 18 year old machine gunner. If he shoots the wrong person or if he makes a mistake, that's on TV that night all around the world. So people are watching and debating and doing a lot of theorizing and talking about things that you're doing. You're actually there on the ground doing it. And to me, that was, that was a pretty interesting factor. I mean, it's, it really is, like I said, unparalleled. Uh, the negative aspects, I mean, obviously there's the, the common one of danger, you know, personal danger, physical danger, harm, dying. That's, that's kind of an obvious one. And anyone who tells you that they're not afraid of that, especially if they're in a war, is, is definitely lying to you because <laughs> everyone's obviously you know, afraid of that all the time. But you just, you fight it and your training kicks in and you kind of overcome that. Uh, it's very demanding, physically, mentally psychologically, spiritually, it's, it's tough. Um, and as I said before, it's kind of, that kind of manifests itself differently at different stages, but there's always some sort of combination of the three uh, in every, every aspect of what you're doing, whether it be training or over in Iraq. Uh, you give up some personal freedoms, for sure. Uh, believe it or not, the military is not a Dartmouth classroom. They don't just throw out an idea and you bat it around for a while and say, that sounds good, that sounds bad. I mean, you do it. It's an order and you do it. So that takes a little while to get used to. And, you know, I never had any experience with getting very bad orders, but I'm sure it does happen. But it's really, unless something you think is really amoral or unlawful, you carry out your orders and that's, you do what you're told. That being said, it also provides a much more, uh, much more flexibility than might appear uh, to you know, the untrained eye, they say, here's our objective, go do your own plan. So there is a lot of actual creativity involved in the planning process for a lot of these missions. Um, the, you know, another, it, it is both positive and negative aspect is just situations arise as, as in any other job that are just very difficult, morally difficult, uh, you, you can be very well trained in, in the details and the tactical knowledge of how to shoot machine guns, how to do this, how to do that. Um, what's hard is things like rules of engagement. When do you shoot? When do you not shoot? You're driving and a black car is coming at you at 70 miles an hour, tinted windows. You don't know if there's children in there. You don't know if they can't read your signs that say stay back. Do you shoot? Do you not shoot? Where do you shoot? How many times do you shoot? Do you let them come in and blow you up? Because that has happened many times. Um, so I would say a lot of the times, the hardest part or a very frustrating part <clears throat> is balancing that respect for people over there. And believe me, we're extremely culturally sensitive, sometimes a detriment and of our safety. We'll bend over backwards to help anyone. And if there's ever any, any question about erring on the side of caution, we will always err on the side of caution. And that can be very frustrating sometimes. Um, it, it may sound very heartless and cold to say, but I would much rather see someone who's trying to kill us over there die than one of my guys. They're placed in my trust and in my care, and I don't want to see any of them die. So balancing that, that dilemma between protecting yourself and waging a war, because it is a war, yet carrying out all these civic duties you know, running the power, doing politics, uh, policing, cleaning up garbage, setting up schools, doing hospitals, everything that we do. Um, that, that can be tough sometimes. You're taking a bunch of trained warriors and telling them, okay, only shoot in the most dire of circumstances and do all these other things that you may or may not have been trained for. So I would argue that, you know, our, our military, they really do do a very good job at that and they do, are extremely flexible. You know, you may be a logistics officer one day and you may be doing an infantry patrol the next. Or, you know, you may be a battalion commander in the army, but you may spend the majority of your day meeting with Sunni tribal sheikhs and trying to, 
you know, negotiate differing points of view on how to get your, your their city running again. Um, so that that can be tough at times, but again, it's it's like everything else. At the time, it's very hard, but I would argue at the end of it, you're very much a better person for having done it, and you learn a lot and grow a lot. Um, and obviously, injuries. I mean, that's just <laughs> I kind of touched on that, the physical part of things. Uh, anyway, at the risk of being long-winded, I apologize if that was too long, but uh, that was just kind of my thoughts on on everything and my my background and my story and how I came to this decision to, to join. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Um, we've gone a little bit over our usual time, and so those of you that uh, have somewhere to go, feel free to get up and uh, go. Otherwise, though, the rest of us, we're happy to stick around for a little while and answer any questions that you might have. I'm going back for a third tour, and, and certainly my views are probably very, very different than that 20-year-old uh, who doesn't get paid nearly what I get paid. Uh, and, and while it, I, I can't speak for, for each individual, I can tell you that as a whole, uh, the Army that I'm familiar with, and this, I'm probably just a prisoner of my past and uh, my experience, is this volunteer force. And having a large, I guess your premise is that we'd, we'd need a compulsory draft in order to sustain Iraq uh, or, or an operation like Iraq. Well, well, well there are. The Army is going busted. Without a doubt. With, without a doubt. I, I, I don't doubt that at all. Yet, as difficult as it is, as it, is it is sustainable. Uh, so the fact that it's difficult on those of us who choose to serve, I think is not the reason to break the entire model, go back to a very divisive draft model that would force those who don't want to be there to serve in the armed forces. So I don't mean this to, to you know, my comfort and, and desire to hang out with my wife is not enough of a reason to bring back the drafts so that you don't strain the military. The, army, the military is without a doubt strained, but I think it's the, it's the price and perhaps it's what applies the political pressure to change the environment that will get us out of Iraq. Well, I commanded draftees and they were terrific. Well, see, again, and that, that, this is the perspective that I don't have and why that, that is useful information. That, that being said, I think that this is sustainable, painful but sustainable. Oh, yeah, but, but there's more than just that. There are things that one can do, like developing incentives uh, to serve. I think we have that with the ROTC. Um, one of the reasons I was in that warehouse in uh, uh, Alexandria, Virginia, was I, was I was working on an ROTC book, as a matter of fact. Um, and it is very clear that once the United States got out of its isolationist period, uh, which we had been in until the Second World War, we had to do something about being sure that either we developed uh, the incentives for uh, officer training particularly, either we had to expand the military academy system, this was one alternative, or we had to develop ROTC. And uh, it's very clear what has happened. I think Peter uh, mentioned that he came to Dartmouth with the scholarship from the Navy. Um, and a scholarship program has, has, has boosted up the uh, enrollments in ROTC over the years. And it was not easy to do this. But that's the way we've done it. The other thing that has boosted up the um, enlisted man's uh, uh, in, uh, service has been uh, working to go to school afterwards, to get some, some incentive for, for serving. 
uh, if you can't, you come from a, a family that can't afford to send you to, to college or community college or wherever you want to go, or technical school, you go into the military, and if there is a, the equivalent of what I had, which was the GI Bill of Rights, then that's an incentive to go in. So I think the question is not whether we have a draft or not, whether we need a draft. Uh, that's a very unpopular kind of thing, uh, obviously. But it's whether we can develop incentives in the society, as we do for other professions. The military is a profession that we need. It's a profession that we need, and therefore we have to develop public incentives for people to go into the military. The woman in the floral print dress. Uh, thank you. Um, my little brother just finished boot camp in the National Guard, and he was telling me about his M16, and he said it takes about five or six rounds to actually drop your opponent. And in this war, where people are using IDEs and suicide bombers and are fundamentally religiously motivated, is the M16 still a valid weapon, where the philosophy behind it was that you shoot a man down and his two buddies have to carry him off the field? I want to know if our army and our people are being equipped with the best things that they have to get the job done. I can, I can speak to that. Um, the M16 is a very good weapon. Um, they have an M4, which is a smaller version that's becoming very popular. Uh, all, most of the units have it. It's the same thing. It's just a smaller stock. Um, it has pretty good stopping power. Usually when, when anyone goes out on patrol and leaves a wire, they all have M16s, but that's really not, it's not as much our bread and butter anymore as if something goes wrong, we have uh, 240 Golf machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns, mounted heavy machine guns up on turrets. We also have a Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher. The problem is not um, that we don't have enough to use, it's that, I mean, there are very, very stringent and strict rules on when you can use it and how you can use it. For example, uh, I mean, I limited ours to one Mark 19 grenade launcher because there's almost no situation that I would be authorized to use it. You know, I, obviously we're coming under attack, I, I would use it, but it, it can take down some of these small buildings in, in these little shanty towns, so. I would say we definitely are equipped with everything we need. It's just a matter of, it's more of a, a, an argument over, over the will to use things or the appropriateness of using certain things, certain weapons at certain times. I'll tell you one thing. Um, I'll bet you, when you were there, you also carried a 45 <coughs> or a 38 pistol on your head? Uh, nine millimeter Beretta. Right. So that's. That was the weapon of choice, whether it was a Reese gun, 45 automatic, or whatever, for close in work as an M16. Until it tumbles a little bit, it doesn't do much. But uh, everybody's got the weapons they need if you have to buy them even on the open market when you get out there. Right, the, the Beretta. It was in Iraq, or, and I'm talking from my son was in the first Gulf War and the second ones, they're both in the National Guard. And, Everybody's just picking up whatever they need, even shotguns. For right, we do have shotguns. Stuff. The Beretta doesn't have much stopping power, I do know that. I've heard stories of people shooting insurgents in the face and them literally not stopping, coming right at them. But the M16 does a pretty good job. Yeah, I'm going to move our conversation off a little bit from applied <laughs> ballistics. Um, <laughs> Mr. Craig. Yeah. Thanks, Al. Um, and thank you all for your service and your sacrifice. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate your uh, eloquent stories today. Um, we could debate this war all day, um, but maybe instead we could talk about uh, some bigger picture issues. I want to say, by the way, my stepson was in El uh, Assad at the same time you were there. Really? Uh, the Marines, yeah. It's a good base. They have a pizza hut in the subway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I still have a niece over there doing intelligence work. Um, at the moment, though, when I think about all of your range of experience, I think about the fact that we haven't declared a war since World War II. And I think that the real issue behind whether Americans should or should not participate in a draft, for instance, might be that our founding fathers were most afraid of a standing army, that there's nothing more inimical, inimical uh, to democracy, perhaps, than a standing army, not because soldiers are bad men, but because bad men might use soldiers um, to pursue political ends. And um, when we don't have any more tradition of declaring war, and therefore people can send soldiers off to war without a due process. Isn't there a political safety, a, a, a sort of a break on rash action 
in having a draft and having some kind of service. And Mr. Demko, by the way, mentioned other forms of service, civilian service, other things that men could do. But if, if, if right now there was a draft, this war would not be going on, I suspect. And if, if everyone isn't involved, if all Americans aren't involved in the process, aren't we a little more at danger of people using the military to do things that might not be in the people's best interest in the long run? Yeah, that, that argument certainly makes sense on the one hand. However, if we had a draft that had been in place and had become part of the fabric of our society that we were used to, having the large capacity to, to carry out war may actually make it easier for our elected officials. If, if we had more army than we knew what to do with, we wouldn't struggle, perhaps, and this is all conjecture, with deploying it and using it. If you just have you know, Rich and Wes and a couple of others, yes, yahoos, that, that for, for all the right reasons, I hope, or maybe it's join the army to go to college, but we have this small military that you can only use a handful of places, you're probably gonna be a little more selective. But, but I do absolutely understand your, your argument. Having a large standing army, I think, can be just as dangerous as having a smaller, more nimble army. If I may, just to correct, I agree. And I guess what I want to ask you about is what about a small, not very good army? Uh, well, I, I don't think that, that we have that, but well, no, I, know. I don't mean that sort of speaking for the corporate army. But. No, we have a terrific professionalized army. What if we had, although it would annoy you as a good professional, what if we had a small draft-fed army that in a sense was maybe not as great an army as it could be, but in that sense was more of a democratic army? Would that be a little safer? <laughs> Yeah, I just have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, first off, I think that anybody that would be serving in that military uh, would be deeply skeptical of a commitment to mediocrity. Um, I think having not served in combat but having trained a lot for that, one of the constant themes is training to save your life. Realistic training is hideously expensive. Other countries have made that choice, though. They have made the odd, they've basically made the decision to say, we're going to trade lives for technology and money. The French are notorious over the last 20 years of having said that French civil spirit is what will carry us through. Now, that said, they have small forces, smaller sets, subsets of their forces that are highly, highly trained. At the end of the day, I'm personally skeptical of the claim that mediocrity ends up serving as a significant break on public policy. The United States' role in the international system, I'm not convinced, is dictated by the scope or size of our military. The, and one last thing about your, your first point about the non-declaration of war. I think that's a little bit of a canard or red herring. Um, war becomes illegal with the Kellogg-Briand pact. This is my, putting on my pointy-headed professor's hat here for a second. War, the declar the uh, fighting of war outside of then the League of Nations, now the United Nations, first becomes illegal in 1928 or 29, um, becomes explicitly illegal outside of the Security, uh, Security Council resolution. Um, I think that the United States, for a variety of reasons, some we could have a long argument about whether it's good, good reasons or bad reasons, but the United States government essentially has reserved for itself the role of deciding when it will use its military. It will not subject, subject uh, decisions about that role to the international community. But recognizing that it would be illegal, we instead have votes and due process over decisions to authorize the use of force. I think that Congress in 2003 came as close as we're actually expect to see or need to see to, in fact, have voted for a declaration of war. We have a, a question here? Yeah? It seems to be a tug of war here, which is an either or, about um, the need for a a large standing army and a need for a draft, or the need for the type of volunteer force we have. I think there's a lot of room in the middle. Those of us who are old enough to remember back in the early 90s, the American military was a lot larger. Uh, we actually have a very small force in Iraq. And, and I was over there in 2004 in Ramadi and Fallujah uh, as well. Um, part of our problems we have now uh, come from the fact that we, we tried to fight the war on the cheap. Uh, not debating the, the causes or, the, or, the, or the, the justification for war. War is something that if we should have learned anything from Bob McNamara, you don't fight it on a, on a profit margin. Um, 
Back in 94-95, we cut four full infantry divisions out of the Army and almost a full division out of the Marine Corps. We're talking about, and, and rightfully so, uh, how the armed forces are broken because people have to go back and back and back and back. Uh, Colonel Morales, you could probably uh, not in agreement with the fact that eight more combat brigades in that cycle would mean one hell of a lot to not having guys go back four times. Same thing in the Marine Corps as we begin now authorizing, authorizing increase in end strength. Um, we, we have an opportunity now to have uh, fewer and fewer rotations. Um, some thoughts from the guys who have been there recently about um, what, what size force you guys looking maybe uh, up at the big picture would want to see over in Iraq. Because 135,000 people in the course of fighting a war, because we are so far from Professor Lyons World War II, 135,000 people sounds like a tremendous amount of folks, but it really isn't. So some thoughts from you guys on what you think a, an appropriate force level might be, politics aside. Well, <clears throat> again, it's a little above my pay grade, but I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> Uh, the whole, as far as I can understand, the, the beginning of the war was, was, and what they see, I think, the future of a lot of wars being, especially in these urban conflicts, is the whole small footprint idea. And that's what, that was the, the idea under General Casey and with Rumsfeld at the beginning of the war. Um, I don't think, as nice as that is on paper and in theory, I, I'm not sure that it works, only because if you look at Iraq as the latest example, what we were doing with the small footprint was, was not working. That's why we sent in General Petraeus in January, and that's why he made a huge um, tactical or strategic, um, he took a different approach, being the surge, and they're actually, you know, flooding Baghdad, as far as I know, with more, they're, you know, establishing many more security checkpoints, much bigger presence. I think it was like 21 and a half thousand more army troops there. Um, so I think that, that although the, the small footprint idea is good, in theory, it, and it may or may not work in the future with, with advances in weapons and, and ideas. Right now, its latest application, it definitely it hasn't worked as well. And I think that ultimately, anytime you sacrifice technology for, for having boots on the ground and people there, you're ultimately making a sacrifice because you're just there's no substitute for having people there. So I think that, and also the one other point that uh, Professor Stam was kind of alluding to is Anytime you're going to make any drastic change in the United States military, you have to think of the global implications. Whether they would admit it or not, all of Europe and most of the rest of the world is at, in some way, either directly or indirectly, dependent on us having a strong military. And so anything that we do to, to reduce that or drastically change it is going to have large implications that, again, they may not admit, but we are essentially the world's police force, so I think that the larger numbers are something that probably need to be kept. Time for one last one. Yeah. We'll change the subject. A couple of years ago, a nationally known law school professor named Alan Dershowitz suggested that there be a, a situation in place <coughs> to obtain warrants for torture based upon the fact that, and it was just an article in the newspaper this weekend, that the majority of Marines and soldiers that were interviewed suggested that they would in fact torture somebody if it meant saving their people. Uh, we have warrants for arrest based on probable cause, warrants for search warrants for the same reason. After somebody, you know he has information that will save your people or harm your people? What do you feel? Should, should, should there be a, something, should there be a, something in place to allow for the legalized obtaining of this information? I'm sure it's... No, I don't think there should be. And, and that is not to say that, that I don't value the lives of my soldiers and I don't value my own personal safety. I think that it's just... It, as, as hard as it may be to understand, because we, we have so many incidents, you know, Abu Ghraib being one of them, uh, one of the things that, that we as a military have as a strength is a moral high ground. And torture, uh, first of all, I'm not convinced that the information that you, that you receive, and I don't say this firsthand, but Iraqis in the regime that they were accustomed to are very fond of torture. And one of the things that, that has consumed us is trying to reprogram them 
to, to behave at least militarily, those that are in our care and our training and our charge, to abandon that tactic. I mean, we, 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 will, we will fire people that, that are involved in anything that smells of torture. So I'm not convinced that the, that the information, the intelligence that you derive from torture, uh, you know, Senator McCain, others who have been subjected to torture will be the first to tell you that, that at some point everyone breaks and will say anything to stop the torture. So practically speaking, I don't think it's helpful. Uh, from a larger perspective, uh, I, I think it's more damaging to our reputation, our ability to get things done. Uh, the fact that the Iraqi population, for the most part, believes that we do, and, and this, this might seem very odd, uh, given that the way the, the news is reported, but for the most part, your average Iraqi on the street believes that we do more good than harm. Now, in a big picture, clearly we've helped break that country, and, and there are all kinds of ways that you could dispute that, but the, the Iraqis that I spoke to day in, day out, uh, benefited from our protection for, for a variety of reasons uh, and believe that if Wes and his Marines are put in a situation in a dark, stormy corner or, or dark, stormy night, they're going to do the right thing, which means they're not going to indiscriminately kill people. They're not going to target uh, innocents. They're not going to go after those that they don't have accurate intelligence. So that's my take on torture, and I think it's more harm than good taking the easy way out and the, lo the low ground versus the high ground. Thank you very much.